a direct illustration of a Rosicrucian initiation school. Again, we have very little time tonight, so I just want to give you a general sense of this. Classically, as I mentioned, the Rosicrucian initiation system is based on individuals. They can work alone, they can work in small groups, whatever it is, but there's no uh, central authority, there's no central institution. And so we tend not to have any real Rosicrucian initiation schools, etc. Again, there are different Rosicrucian organizations. They make varying levels of claim. But the classical impulse that you find with Rosicrucianism is, is very much that of what they call self-initiation. And the idea is that once you can awaken that I am inside through certain processes, then the task is to connect directly to spirit and not have to do it through connecting through another human being that will then connect you to spirit. And this is not a new idea. I mean, the original Buddhists were all about this. You know, Buddha was all about the direct connection. And then after Buddha died, to be honest, in some parts of Buddhism, a priesthood came in that said, well, we'll pray to Buddha for you, kind of thing. <laughs> and, and this is kind of an old story. But uh, the general idea is, no, we want to correct directly. So Rudolf Steiner, a remarkable uh, teacher living in Austria, who again, from my perspective, if you study his works, was really the most advanced Rosicrucian ever to teach publicly. That doesn't mean he was ever the most, the most advanced Rosicrucian of all time, but he was the most advanced one that ever was like publicly out giving talks and doing these types of things. For those of you that know about the work of Rudolf Steiner, uh, he lived from 1861 to 1925, and he left behind over 350 volumes of spiritual text. And there's material in those 350 volumes that you won't find anywhere else in print having to do with initiation teachings of different traditions over time. Some really deep stuff, really remarkable. You have to get a little bit of a foundation under your belt sometimes to understand what he's talking about in the more advanced works, like anything else. But uh, it's amazing what's there. So Steiner himself actually ran an initiation school within Rosicrucianism from 1904 to 1914, uh, mostly in Germany and Switzerland. And the people that joined this school were meant to go through a particular path of development. But because it's so individual in its nature, Steiner would give different exercises to different people, depending on their structure and what they're developing toward. And so they actually had four different pathways you could enter in on when you began. The first pathway was called the general discipline. And it was somewhat similar to classical Hindu or Buddhist types of approaches. The general discipline that he had in his school was things like you would meditate at certain times of the day. You do various types of self-observation. Uh, you would go through a very grounded day-to-day -day process of spiritual work, spiritual study, things of that kind. The other three paths were a bit more specialized. The first one is a path that is mostly for people that are in the thinking pole, in the head. And that was called the Pythagorean, or the intellect, intellectual or art pathway. For those of you that have a background in sacred geometry or the Pythagorean work, the Pythagorean school was one that taught types of science and art based on classical spiritual teachings, mostly from Egypt. Uh, Pythagoras was actually trained in Egypt and in Babylon. Uh, I'm not going into all the details of that, but the basic idea is that if you look at the Pythagorean work, it's all related to sacred geometry, sacred number, various types of patterns in the world, and hidden within it are secrets of things like resonance and harmonics. Resonance is the process with which whatever energy quality we're holding at whatever level, whether it's within our energy body, emotional body, mental body, etc., whatever that energy quality is will resonate like a tuning fork with other beings, processes, planes of the same nature. And harmonics is where that resonance doesn't only take place on the physical plane. It can take place across multiple octaves expressed scientifically, but spiritually it means that that resonance can be between something here on the physical world and something in higher spiritual worlds. And so resonance and harmonics is all through the Pythagorean work. So a person on this pathway, they would definitely be studying things like sacred geometry. They'd be understanding the intellectual teachings. They'd be understanding the uh, patterns of creation and also working with them in art, directly expressing them, understanding them through doing to a certain extent. And so what this is meant to do is it illuminates the thinking. Again, not as just a type of intellectual activity, but to where the intellect develops to where it actually becomes clairvoyant. And so when we talk about something like sacred geometry forms, 
very commonly when we teach sacred geometry here at the Vesica Institute, the majority of the students that take the class will come up to me later and say, you know, I've seen these patterns before. I've seen them in my meditations. I saw this one in my dream. Or I worked with a teacher in the Himalayas who gave me this pattern, or something like this. The patterns are related to direct thought forms of the mind of God that hold pattern the way we discussed before. The second of these was known as the Christian Gnostic or a devotional path. And this was really a heart-based path. It was a path of devotion. And we'll talk a little bit more later on when we talk about different levels of initiation or paths of initiation. But this is really a heart-based path. It's, it's about devotional study and prayer of the heart, things of that kind. So we can develop various centers uh, of the three primary centers, and it's really a question of which one we're crystallizing first. Or we can take what was known as the karma path or the action path, and that was a path of the will. That was people that really just want to go out and do it. They want to do something, and it's through the actual movement and the activity that they get initiated to a higher level. Something wakes up in them from the actual doing. And an example within the Rosicrucian work were people that worked in biodynamic agriculture. So they actually worked in the world. They're working with the forces of the earth and they're transmuting it to a higher level. They bring the life forces back into the earth through doing. And of course this is also related to recent studies that have been done of human development and how our actual moving of the body is essential for the development of our thinking process and the brain and things like that. So that essentially uh, there are many fields now of uh, educational kinesiology and related fields in which they describe the way that a child moves and acts in a certain way in the first few years and it lays down all the neural pathways for later in life and the actual physical movements have to be there. So anyway, there were, they understood there are four different pathways that could be taken. Now as you're moving through a process of initiation, this process could uh, take on different forms at different stages. And so depending on what tradition you're looking at at what time, they would have different names for the stages of development. You'd go from one stage to the next stage. So in classical initiation in the West, they would go often and use these types of terms for the stage of the person, sometimes in veiled form. There's a wonderful book that we have here on the back table called The Burning Bush by Edward Ray Smith. Edward Ray Smith was a Methodist minister who began to realize there was a lot within the esoteric tradition that explained the stuff that he had studied in his Bible studies. He was a Bible scholar, you know, he could read the Greek, he could read the Hebrew, all that sort of thing. But he realized that a literal interpretation of a lot of this doesn't really work. That they're actually referring to something that when you study the esoteric tradition, it perfectly fits into place. So in The Burning Bush, it's a wonderful work where he summarizes a lot of the terms used in the Old and New Testament and what they actually meant within the initiation traditions for the Essenes, things like that. It's a, in a very grounded way. So the first stage of initiation in the classical initiation was called the raven. And so you see pictures of ravens in some types of alchemical manuscripts. And if you study the Old Testament, you'll see that the uh, story of the initiation of Elijah, they say that Elijah was fed by a raven in the wilderness. And so for anyone that was part of the Kabbalistic initiation system, they knew what that meant. They knew that he is at the stage of the raven at that point. Because the raven is a dark bird. It has to do with uh, this dark element of the soul that is going to become illuminated through the process. The next stage is the occultist or the hidden scholar. And at that point, the person begins to actively study the spiritual realities behind the manifest world. At the next stage, they become known as the warrior. In the variant on this tradition that became the uh, Christian Grail initiation in, in medieval times, this stage was called the Knight. And the warrior stage was one in which one actually begins to work in the world for the goals and purposes one learns at these earlier stages. One becomes active working with it and applying it in the world. Next stage is that of the Lion. There's some very interesting things in the early Holy Grail text, like the book Parsifal, describing the nature of the lion. A lot of it has to do actually with the transformation of the heart and of the illumination of the heart. As I mentioned to you before, the Rosicrucians describe the way that when our heart is really illuminated and open, that that releases the rose stream of light from the etherized blood that moves up to the third eye and then illuminates the cave of Brahma for higher clairvoyance. 
So we can develop forms of clairvoyance without the activity of the heart, but that form of clairvoyance 